All right. As I said, we're going to be finishing up our uh, study on mental divorce this morning. We're going to have uh, one other topic we're going to discuss, and then next week we'll start Lesson 10, I believe it is, uh, in our book, back in our book, Lesson on uh, Abortion, I believe is the topic. So, as we've been discussing regarding mental divorce, this is the idea that because in individuals who believe this way, they believe that just because you get a divorce, you get a legal man's legal divorce, you're not technically divorced in God's eyes. So it never actually happened, which means certainly that sin couldn't have been committed if it never happened or if God didn't acknowledge it, then it wasn't sinful to do, which certainly opens up the uh, issue of First Corinthians 7 where Paul commanded the husband and the wife not to divorce. Uh, that was the commandment, and again, Matthew 19, 9, except for the cause of, of adultery, that is the only reason for divorce. And so if they were to tear asunder, which the woman did in 1 Corinthians 7, she breaks the commandment, or the man does, uh, they break the commandment of the Lord, and therefore sin is committed. But with the idea of mental divorce, the idea is we're still married in God's eyes, so it's, there's no being bound by law, Romans 7, in their mind, it's all, all one and the same. And so because we're still married in God's eyes, when the spouse eventually remarries, whether it be six months later or 20 years later, then they can just put that person away in their mind. Uh, and again, I've asked uh, an individual I studied with on this years ago, and I asked them, well, what did you do when you put your spouse away? And he said, well, I said a prayer. And I said, well, where do you find that in Scripture, that to divorce your spouse, you say a prayer? It's not, you don't find that in Scripture. You never find a, a mental divorce or a putting away after a uh, societal binding ceremony or whatever it is has taken place that has brought about a divorce. Again, under the Jewish law, it was a writing of divorcement. That's why Jesus mentions a writing of divorcement. Different cultures have different ways in which divorces are decreed. Okay, so that's all that's, that's mentioned is regarding the, the recognized method by which a society determines what constitutes a divorce. In our society, it is the full papers signed, dated, stamped. It's all the way through and it's done. And that's when our society determines that these two people are no longer married. Uh, never are, do we have demonstrated in Scripture uh, the individual, an individual praying to God after a man's law divorce has taken place. We don't ever find mention of a second divorce that takes place. Again, there's all this talk about accommodative speech. Well, when Paul says that the woman in Romans 7, she divorces her husband and marries another man, he doesn't really mean he ma she marries him, just marries him in God's eyes. Well, there had to have been, at some point, in some way, there has to be a second divorce being mentioned in Scripture somewhere for this to have any kind of merit or weight. Some example of an a individual or a situation in a marriage where these two individuals divorce in man's eyes, but not in God's eyes, and then at some other point, the man or the woman comes before the church and formally acknowledges her divorcing of her spouse or offers up a prayer or anything. And yet we don't have any example of that. In fact, what we see is that divorce only ever takes place while a marriage relationship exists. That's the only example we have in the New Testament. After a marriage relationship is dissolved via divorce, there is not a single example of any other type of divorce that takes place. The only other example or any kind of reference to the dissolving of the binding of law is in Romans chapter 7 with the death of that one to whom that person is bound. So in the case of Romans 7, that woman divorced her husband. If he eventually passes away, she is then freed from being bound to him because she can't be bound to, to the ether. Okay, so he's passed away. As long, as long as he lives, though, she's still bound. She's not married to him, but she's still bound. 
Uh, this also suggests a very subjective definition for what a divorce is, where one person may come before the elders or brethren to pronounce their putting away of a guilty spouse. Another person may only say a prayer or simply say to themselves, I'm done with my spouse. Uh, and yet, in Scripture, there's a, a formal acknowledgement of society as to what a divorce was. And that's the example we have. And for that matter, so the same is true with marriage. And I think that's important to note because I've known some Christians, I'll say younger individuals who were probably not as knowledgeable as they should have been in Scripture, but especially at Florida College, for instance, I knew some individuals who were convinced that you could kind of have a ceremony just between you and your intended out in the woods somewhere, and that, that counts. You can have your formal ceremony somewhere else later, but if you, it's between you and her and God, or you and him and God, and so you can go off in the woods by yourselves, get married, and you're married. But I don't believe that's the case. I believe that God, both with regard to the process of marriage and the process of divorce, it is the acknowledging of whatever society considers binding. And like that's why we said, it's not, I don't like to use the terms legal, okay? Because technically, legally, from a document perspective, two people who go through a marriage ceremony aren't yet married until they receive those, that marriage, uh, marriage certificate back, stamped, and everything. Legally. But we all acknowledge, we all understand that they are because they have made the vows, they've been declared, and even though technically the document isn't through yet, we acknowledge everybody understands that they're married now. And I believe that's how God views it as well. Whatever society deems as binding in the case of a marriage or a divorce, that's binding. Thoughts or comments through that? Yes, sir. Yes. How does that kind of play out? That's a great that's a great question because it's sometimes people refer to this as the Philippine problem because there are places in the world like the Philippines where you're not allowed to divorce your spouse. It doesn't matter what the reason is. Now, the example that we have, the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 19.9, does Jesus command that we divorce our spouse if they commit adultery? Does he say we have to? No. Therefore, it is that option is available but just because I can do something, does that mean I have to do something? No. And so in the case of, for instance, in the Philippines, what would a Christian, what would, what would the only recourse of a Christian be in that situation? Well, I mean, the, the point so there is... That right, it does. However, since man's law says we don't allow divorce that in that situation, we don't divorce. That's all there is to it. There's just not a process for it. it doesn't, I'm not sure that they don't allow for it. They just don't have a legal process. Or so are we making it more than about the document versus the relationship? Then? I guess uh, I'm not clear on in the Philippines. As far as I know, they don't acknowledge divorce at all. Right, that's what I'm saying. There's not even a Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not allowed. It's, it's not, not allowed to divorce. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how you would go about the process of determining a divorce in a place where divorce isn't allowed. And in that situation, if it's not allowed there, I mean, it, it's not, God never commands divorce. Divorce is an option in that scenario. But I don't have to. Therefore, in the situation where I'm living in a place where divorce is not allowed, it doesn't matter what happens. If divorce is not allowed where I'm living, I can't divorce. Okay, what process would I use? What, what would I do to biblically follow the example or the precedent set in Scripture to divorce a spouse in a nation that doesn't allow in any way a revenue for divorce or a, uh, 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 a path to divorce? I don't know. Would you come before the brethren and say, I'm divorcing my spouse for adultery? We don't see that in scripture. And so if, it, if I'm living in the Philippines and I'm in that situation, I don't do anything. I, I remain alone. 
hope I can talk my spouse into coming back to me. Because I don't know, I would, I would be going without any scriptural precedent uh, in a place that doesn't allow for divorce. And I'm not prepared to do that for myself. And it's the same type of situation we talk about regarding uh, instrumental music, any other thing that is beyond what's authorized or what we have an example of. Just because God allows it doesn't mean I have to do it. In this case, they're actually restricting, okay, and it's not coming into conflict with God's law. God doesn't command me to divorce. I don't like it, but I don't know what else I, I don't know what else I could do. But I mean, that's, that's one of those situations that people ask about, you know, those hypothetical, and certainly in the Philippines, it's not hypothetical. Um, but in that situation, I guess you make doubly sure that you know who you're marrying and that you do your best to, to uh, make sure that the, the two remain commu in communication with one another. Uh, try to do the best you can to maintain that relationship. Uh, because I don't, I don't know as a Christian what else you could do in that type of scenario. Because again, there is no... There is no spiritual path designated in Scripture by which one can declare a divorce. Any other thoughts or comments on that? I just have a question. Mm -hmm. Well, it went, back, it went back to what Moses said about writing a, a, a proclamation of divorcement. Usually those proclamations contained a purpose or a reason for which this person was being divorced. It is important to note that under the old law, you could not remarry a former spouse. So once you put away a spouse, you couldn't remarry them. Okay, that was a key component under the old law. In fact, that's been brought up before as well. Well, the old law says you can't remarry your former spouse. So... Why are you trying to tell us in 1 Corinthians 7 we have to reconcile to our spouse? And my point is, we're not under the old law anymore. So was that, I guess what I'm asking is, was that kept in a certain place? Did the man or woman keep that? It, I, it was a formal document. I don't know if it had to go through any court. I haven't read anything about it being sent to a court. Uh, but it was a formal document that that woman then had to be able to show in any other, in any situation that might involve question of her relationship or past relationship, to be able to show this is why I was put away. I was just curious how they did that. Yeah. I mean, and there was there was some sort of a a signet or a stamp of authority. I don't know if it went. I didn't go before the Sanhedrin, but there was some sort of acknowledgement that this is official that they used. Yeah. Any other thoughts or comments to that? Yes, sir. And you never just answered. <clears throat> I came across this this week. If you if you put your wife away and she remarries, can you remarry her? No. Okay. Oh wait, wait, no, wait a minute. No, no, specify what do you mean by that? Okay. So you're, you you divorce your wife. Yeah. She goes and marries somebody else. And she comes back. Okay. Yeah. Can you remarry her? Yeah, you can. Yeah. I mean, it, whether you put her away for adultery or not doesn't... Uh, she's still bound by law. If you, Regardless of if she's put away for adultery or not, she's still bound. Even if she remarries? Well, even if she remarries, she's never bound to that individual. She's not allowed to be married to them. Okay. And so even though she married, she did so unlawfully. She can be remarried to you, and, and I've seen that happen. I know of a situation where that has taken place. Me too, but I heard someone say this week that you could not. I, again, under the, and they may have been thinking under the old law, and that even gets up, brought up among Christians sometimes, that the old law says you can't marry a previous spouse. But yet Paul says specifically that the woman who tore asunder from her husband in 1 Corinthians 7 she only had two recourses. One was to remain unmarried, don't include someone else in your sin, or be reconciled to that man to whom you're bound. And again, that re term reconcile is you've done wrong against that man, you need to reconcile. Well, what if he won't take me back? Well, then what? Then I remain unmarried. I mean, by, by all means, don't include someone else 
in what you're doing, in some sin. Uh, Joe, I just saw your hand. Any other thoughts or comments with that? Okay. Man does make it complicated. In fact, you know, I've had several of you mention to me after classes, in between classes, service, and so forth, how, first of all, this is one of those situations that it's a very emotional topic for people. And I've said this before, that first of all, emotion and emotional considerations are probably the number one reason why some people never come to, to the, the faith and why some Christians fall away from the faith it's almost always some emotional consideration. And of those instances, a lot of the times it's gonna be based around a relationship. Whether it's a relationship that I'm in or a relationship that my child is in. I mean, I've, I know of a preacher who for years taught the, this very same truth on the gospel, what the Bible teaches, and then his daughter came into a situation he wanted, he felt bad for his daughter. He wanted to try to find some way to give her the, the means to get rid of that situation, get out of that relationship. And so he found a way to twist scripture and he did it. He, he twisted scripture and said, well, she can divorce. She just can't remarry. And it's with an example I'll show you here in just a minute. But because of that situation, he basically forced scripture into his, the definition he's wanting to use and made it okay. And I've seen that happen many, many times, and not just with marriage and divorce, but with all types of situations. I know of a situation taking place right now in another place regarding a family member who is in a, a state, uh, living in a state of fornication, living with a boyfriend. She is a Christian, and the brethren there are, they were having a hard time getting people to say that this is wrong, we need to withdraw from her. Because again, it's that emotional situation and she has lots of family members there at the congregation and for the love of the family, we need to just kind of let it be. What does Paul command in 1 Corinthians 5? Not just suggest or say, this is probably what you should do. What does is, what is the Lord command through Paul in 1 Corinthians 5? You withdraw from them, okay? That is the emotional consideration. Why? Because I care about their soul. And if we've done everything we can, we've reached out to that individual, we've tried to talk to that individual, they refuse to repent, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to withdraw from them. And yet because of, of emotional considerations, people will then take 1 Corinthians 5, and this, this has happened. Okay? This is a, a current situation where somebody went to 1 Corinthians 5 and they made the statement that that's not the context of 1 Corinthians 5. That context of 1 Corinthians 5 is where you have a, a brother or sister in sin and the brethren are glorying in it. That's the context. So as long as we're not glorying in their sin, we don't have to withdraw from them. It doesn't make any sense at all, does it? But that was the argument. That's why 1 Corinthians 5 doesn't count. And certainly 1 Corinthians 5 isn't the only place where uh, those who are not walking according to the truth are... Uh, the brethren are told to, to mark them or withdraw from them. But yeah, it, it is. It, man makes this far more complicated than it needs to be. And certainly there are, there's a lot of unweaving of webs when you have individuals who've been married five, six times who decide they want to become a Christian. And then they ask, so what's my state? What's my situation? Maybe they're even married or have a boyfriend or a girlfriend right now. What do I do? And you have to sit down with them. You have to try to, to work through it. And there have been times where I knew one individual, he had been married eight times. Some of them had been for adultery. Some of them hadn't. And after working through it, my brain was so, uh, I worked through it several times with them. And finally I said, You're just, you can't remarry. That's for sure. Okay, because that was clear. But with regard to the timing of events and so forth, I said, do not remarry. Whatever you do, do not remarry. And uh, uh, that's, that's just kind of the, a lot of the times it's the state. And, and, and this individual, this fellow, he was willing. And he brought it up on several occasions, even in class. Uh, on occasions, we're talking about like emotion overriding scripture. And he talked about the fact, I would love to remarry, but I can't. And I know that. Yes, sir. I read this Google search on the Philippines. 
Yes. Yeah. Because there's a bill provides that a divorce petition will undergo a judicial process where proof of the cause for the divorce is established and that the marriage is completely collapsed without any possibility of reconciliation. That must be a new bill. March 21st, Wow. Okay. So the Philippine problem may no longer be a Philippine problem. It may be. Yeah, I haven't heard that. That's recent. That's within the last month. And the reason we were talking about it is we know somebody there. He's not faithful anymore. He's not really a Christian. However, his wife just like we talked about earlier. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
All right, anything else through, through mental divorce? Okay. So there is another uh, point that I want to bring up. Since we're on this topic, and this is, like I said, we're only going to uh, talk about this through the end of this class, and the next class we'll pick up with our uh, lesson 10 in our book. So in addition to mental divorce, there's such a thing as called mental adultery. And this is actually being taught by preachers in the church. And uh, I've heard it on, on, in several different situations and circumstances. And I think it's important for us to, to talk about. So the idea of mental adultery is going to deal with the idea of lust. And specifically as it applies to pornography. But the scope isn't limited to pornography. So the idea is, so the term porn of pornography you have the Greek term porneia, which is translated fornication or sexual immorality in the New Testament. Therefore, the two get conflated together to say that pornography is the same as porneia. Therefore, if you catch your spouse looking at pornography, you have a reason for divorce. Because in Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 27 and 28, what does Jesus say? Somebody read Matthew, 27, or Matthew 5, 27 through 28 for me. Whoever gets there first. <clears throat> You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust intent, with lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to that, sin, I'm that, that, That's it. Okay. So... Jesus talks about the commandment of the Old Testament about thou shalt not commit adultery, which, to be clear, is that commandment reiterated in the New Testament as well? Yes, it is. But now Jesus is going to take this opportunity to go, to, uh, go further than what the law of the Old Testament specified. He goes to the thoughts of an individual. And he says, if you look on a person, okay, now we're going to substitute man, woman, whatever, Okay, with sexual thoughts in your heart, you've committed adultery with her in your heart already. Okay? Now that is the basis upon which some spouses have determined, well, if my spouse is looking at pornography, they are lusting in their heart, obviously. Therefore, Jesus says they've committed adultery. Therefore, Matthew 19, 9, I have a cause for divorce. That's the thought process. Now, it's important to note, first of all, ironically, that in Matthew chapter 5, the term porneia is not found. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, that term isn't porneia, it's mocheo, which is adultery. But to be clear, okay, you can substitute either one. I believe that Jesus, those to whom Jesus was speaking in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, a lot of them would have been married. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that it is sexual sin, sure. Okay, it's lust in your heart, whether you want to say uh, adultery in your heart or fornication in your heart, both apply. However, when we talk about the term porneia, throughout the New Testament, it's used 26 or 27 times. And it's always used to represent illicit sexual intercourse. Sometimes it's tra translated fornication, sometimes it's translated sexual immorality. And that's where the problem is, is that sometimes, especially the New King James, is translated sexual immorality. And there was actually a post on Facebook that <laughs> it was a, kind of a false equi equivalency. What the post said was, uh, is pornography sexually moral? Well, no, obviously it's not. Therefore, pornography is sexual immorality. And then it linked directly to Matthew 5, 27 and 28. The problem with that. The, the, the concept of sexual immorality is a very broad phrase. You could claim that pornography certainly is immoral. It is sexually immoral. That does not make it fornication, however. Because the term in the New Testament is always used in a physical, bodily sense. In fact, the term adultery is used in the same way, aside from a few occasions where there's spiritual adultery taking place, like in James chapter 4, 
Uh, he refers to those brethren as adulterers and adulteresses against God. But fornication is always used in a physical bodily way. It's never used in a broad sense to include any and all sexually immoral issues. It's specific. And that's important. Because pornography is the depiction of erotic behavior, such as in pictures or in writing, intended to cause sexual excitement. So it's intended to bring about lust, but it is not the bodily uh, inclusion of fornication with another person. That's how that term is used in the New Testament, is fornication. And so when you have that term, that phrase, sexual immorality, then you have this false equivalency being offered. Well, porn certainly isn't sexually moral, therefore it's sexual immorality. And if it's sexual immorality, that means it calls for divorce. That's, that's, again, that's making a false equivalence there. In fact, in Matthew 15 and in verse 19, can somebody read Matthew 15 and verse 19? Okay, so what was the very first thing that Jesus says, out of a man comes what? Evil thoughts. And then the next thing he mentions is what? Murder. So we go from the evil thoughts of an individual to then physical actions of an individual. And in the list of physical actions, you've got murder, you've got theft, and what was, what was another one, Tammy? Adulteries. Okay, that's physical. Even in Matthew 15, 19, Jesus separates the concept of evil thoughts. And, and evil thoughts, now that's a very broad sense as well. That's not just lust, a sinful sexual lust. That could be wishing ill will on someone. That could be covetousness. That could be a lot of things. But evil thoughts, anger, okay, can be murder. Okay, we, we, that fact, that's one of the things that we, uh, we need to, uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, that's, that's, Jesus separates evil thoughts from adultery. Now, if there was ever going to be a place where you were going to go to connect Matthew 19.9 regarding adultery, okay, and then connect it to Matthew 5, for Jesus to put the two together, this would be the place to do it. But Jesus says that evil thoughts, even sexual thoughts, evil thoughts would include sexual thoughts, sinful sexual thoughts, that is different from physical adultery or physical fornication, for that matter. Fornication and adultery are always used in the physical bodily sense. Again, adultery with the, with the exceptions of the times adultery is used in the spiritual sense, unless otherwise specified. Like in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, 28. Where does Jesus say that adultery is taking place? In the heart. The fact that Jesus had to specify that, when the term itself means in the body, in the flesh, Jesus says he's committing sin in his heart. Now, here's the other problem with that. Who's the only one who knows the hearts and thoughts of a person? Only God. Now, granted, and most people would argue, and I, I'll, I'll grant, that looking at pornography, obviously, you would connect that with lust. But the issue here goes beyond just pornography. Because there are sometimes Victoria's Secret commercials that pop up on the TV. Okay? Sometimes you go to the beach, and while you and your family may be dressed modestly, the other people around you may not be. Now, who's to say you've got a husband and his wife sitting at home watching TV after the kids have gone to bed, Victoria's Secret commercial pops up, okay, whatever. They move, it moves on to their show, whatever show they're watching. The next day, the wife files for divorce. Why? Because that Victoria's Secret commercial popped up, and I know that you had to be lusting after them, and since you did so, you committed adultery in your heart, so I'm going to divorce you. He could just, he could just assume do the same, that's, and that's a great point. What would you say, Dwayne? There's a temptation now, but you have to act on that temptation. There you go. There you go. Now, and that's what's so crucial about Matthew 5, 
is to understand the point that Jesus is making. In fact, can somebody read Matthew 5, 21 and 22, please? Matthew 5, a couple of verses up, up before he gets to 27 and 28, verses 21 and 22. heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whatever insult, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. All right. So Jesus, in a very similar way, he references Old Testament, says it's wrong to murder. Okay? It's unlawful to murder. But I say to you, whoever's angry with his brother is in danger. In fact, John tells us in 1 John chapter 3 that whoever hates his brother is a what? A murderer. Okay. Well, if that's the case, should this mean that the one who is angry with his brother or hates his brother should bear the physical consequences of murder? And... Once you start going down that path, what then do we become? Thought police. Thought police. Now we get to observe a person and simply based on our own, even biased perceptions, determine what's in the thought and hearts of an individual and on that basis then pronounce judgment on them in some form or fashion? No. Again, going back to, uh, there's tons of Old Testament scriptures, there's several uh, New Testament scriptures as well, but Romans 8, Hebrews 4, God is the one who searches the hearts. God is the one who knows the thoughts. Okay? And even if you have a situation where a spouse is looking at pornography, obviously, yes, there is, you would think, there would certainly be that involved of lust. However, that physical sin of fornication or adultery did not take place in the flesh. It took place in his heart. Every reference to, well, the only one in Matthew 19, 9, of the exception for divorce, which is for the cause of adultery, it's in a physical sense, bodily sense. Jesus doesn't say whoever divorces his spouse except for the cause of adultery, or, adultery in the flesh or in their heart and marries another commits adultery. He doesn't say that. He doesn't have to say that. Our thoughts and our attitudes lead to action. Right. And that's what Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 15 is about. The action is the punishable part. Right. The thoughts and hints, you know, if I didn't murder, maybe I would just be mugged. Or there's so many different degrees all the way back to I'll never talk to that person. <coughs> See, and here's the thing, and of course, and, and certainly you can sin with your heart, with your thoughts, right? You can sin with your thoughts. But does anybody else know that? Who is the only one who does? Well, the only two people who do. You and God. For instance, when David was on his, his balcony or his porch, and he sees Bathsheba. <clears throat> okay, let's say he goes so far as to lust after her but then stops himself from actually sending his servants to inquire about her, okay? He lusts after her, he goes through that sexual thought, but then he turns around and goes back to bed. Has he committed sin? Yes, okay, that, that would be sinful, and I think David would know that was sinful. But would any of the other stuff that happened with Uriah, with the baby, with all the, the consequences of David's sin... No. If David hadn't pursued that with Bathsheba, that would remain between him and God. And of course, as we know, can we confess our sins and he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins? Sure. Okay. It, it's, that's something that only I ever will know, except for me and God. And of course, I have to be careful and I have to be aware of myself. I have to control my thoughts. But this is I've mentioned this on our, I actually talked about this at one point, it's been about a year and a half ago, on a uh, devotional, trying to conflate pornography with fornication 
It's just a very lazy argument. Uh, again, it doesn't have basis in Scripture. It doesn't have, it, it's, it's just the thinnest of threads that they're trying to connect. And unfortunately, I, I know of several cases where women have been told this. They have been taught this, that you caught your spouse looking at pornography, you can divorce them. And unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of situations at judgment where if these individuals, I, I believe, have committed sin by divorcing in the first place, but especially if they remarry as well and include someone else in their sin, and that's the very thing we've been talking about. Now, the other scenario that I know, at least for a fact, that one preacher was preaching his daughter was in a situation where her husband was drug running through their home. And his daughter didn't want herself or her children in that situation anymore. Now, she had legal recourses, okay? Is it legal to drug run through your home? No, it's not. Is it legal to beat your spouse? No, it's not, okay? She could have very easily contacted the police, gone through that process, I don't, and I don't know if she did, and maybe he was arrested and released, I, I don't know any of that. But what I do know is dad, because of his love for his daughter, albeit misguided attempt to make it okay or better, he sought to find a way to make it okay for her to divorce her spouse. So he goes to Matthew 19 and Luke 18 where Peter says, we have left all for the sake of the kingdom. That term, that left all or forsaken, is the same term of phemi we find in 1 Corinthians 7 for divorce. And so this preacher says, well, they, Peter says, we've left spouses for the sake of the kingdom. Well, if it's for the sake of the kingdom, you can divorce your spouse. But guess what else Jesus says in those contexts? He mentions houses, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, children, and lands. So do you think when it came to the time to talk about spouses that Peter was actually, or Jesus was actually talking about divorcing your spouse? No. But this is just another example of twisting Scripture to make it say what they want it to say. And if you're going to say for the sake of the kingdom or because it's ma they're making it impossible for me to be a Christian, how far are you willing to go with that? Where do you draw the line? All right, that's it for marriage and divorce. Uh, we'll end there. If anybody wants any notes on any of this, I have plenty of notes I can share with you, print out for you. Um, but next week we will move on to lesson 10, dealing with abortion. Thank you, everybody.